I'm not going to say anything too general about this, the status of, of difficulty writ large in early modern literature, but I do want to settle on a few moments and points in which it seems to me poets are engaging with the subject of difficulty in which the problem that difficulty poses is being engaged and thought about in a distinctly early modern kind of way. So where I wanted to start was with Philip Sidney's Apology for Poetry, also known as The Defense of Poesy, which is published posthumously in 1595, and I have a couple of quotes from it, um, the first of which is, I think, is, is, is quite wonderful, because it certainly tells us a lot about what Sidney thought about um, what poetry should do and whether or not it should be difficult. He says, for conclusion, it's wonderful he starts, this is in the middle of the, of the track, he, he tends to say for conclusion, I think, to draw attention <laughs> to a particularly important point. Um, for conclusion, I say that, um, I say the philosopher teacheth, but he teacheth obscurely, so as the learned only can understand him. That is to say, he teacheth them that are already taught. But the poet is the food for tenderest stomachs. The poet is indeed the right popular philosopher. So there's a distancing, that, uh, distancing move that Sidney's making here um, between the discourse of philosophy and the discourse of poetry in an era in which there are um, disciplinary um, distinctions that are emerging, certainly Sidney attests to them, but in which the disciplinary distinctions I think Ben was just referring to have not hardened. In other words, one could imagine oneself if one were Milton, for instance, familiarizing and being able to follow uh, the premises uh, of Newtonian physics while also being able to study epic poetry. Um, nonetheless, we start to see in the 1590s, at least as, this, um, as the defense of poesy is circulated, a certain uh, a, a appreciation for a, a kind of, of, of poetry that's not mimetic in the way that Ben was referring to modernist poetry, I think John was too, that is to say, a kind of poetry that reflects on reality and suggests that because reality is complicated, a poem should be complicated in mimetic terms. What a number of the examples I'm going to suggest or point out to you are doing on the contrary is saying that if you understand the re uh, if you understand reality to be complicated, then actually you're not perceiving the spiritual ramifications and the ordering of reality. Therefore, you're misreading reality. Um, and so I, uh, Dunn, I think, is a great example of this, and we'll go to a, what is often thought to be one of Dunn's hardest poems. Mm -hmm. um, although we'll think about what that means for it to be difficult um, in just a few minutes. So, Sidney has this line then that I just read to you about. Um, um, about poetry um, being um, food for tender stomachs. And then a few pages later, um, in the kind of a, this is a sort of biographical moment, this is quite sad, um, he takes up the Shepherd's Calendar. And um, Edmund Spencer has written the Shepherd's Calendar in 1579 and is so desperate for Sidney's uh, support and patronage for the project that on the title page he puts the title of the, of the poem and then, and then dedicates it to Sidney. Does not does not reveal his own identity. No one cares who Edmund Spencer, a poor scholar, is. Anyway, so uh, if you ever look at the 1579 title page, it says the Shepherd's Calendar for Philip Sidney. <laughs> Sidney then has the following comments about the Shepherd's Calendar that I thought we might think about. The Shepherd's Calendar hath much poetry in his eclogues. Now, granted, now the eclogues are all poetry. But so it's not off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> the Shepherd's Calendar have much poetry in his eclogues, indeed worthy the reading, if I be not deceived. If I am deceived, perhaps it's not worthy of the reading. The same framing of his style to an old rustic language, what Sidney, um, sorry, what Spencer does in the Shepherd's Calendar is he approximates Chaucerian English, not very effectively, he reinvents um, Middle English. The same framing of his style to an old rustic language I dare not allow since neither Theocritus in Greek, Virgil in Latin, nor Sanazora in Italian did affect it. Besides these, I do not remember to have seen but a few. Do I not remember? There's a rhetorical device there. I do not remember to have seen but few to speak boldly printed this kind of poetry, and indeed some of um, Spencer's eclogues perhaps printed before the Fairy Queen. I'm sorry, before the uh, Shepherd's Calendar first appears in 1579. I do not remember to have seen but few to speak boldly printed that have poetical sinews in them. For proof whereof, let but, and, and then this is the standard that he's proposing for how to establish whether or not a poem is good. Uh, let not, sorry, I lost my place. Um, let but most of the verses be put in prose, and then ask the meaning. Do you understand it? And it will be found that one verse did but beget another, without ordering at the first what should be at the last, which becomes a confused mass of words with a tingling sound of rhyme barely accompanied with reason. <laughs> it seems that we're on, uh, that he, he leaves, I think, our purview in terms of what we, what we would imagine to be a process in terms of breaking down a poem. And I'm reminded of um, one of the things that Helen Venler often does, you, uh, if, you, if you read her reviews, is to take, a, uh, sometimes qu quite interestingly in, in this context, will be to take a poem and render it in prose form, as if to suggest that an explication, to perform an explication of the poem uh, 
transferring into prose. Um, Sydney's point here is, I, 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 I think, somewhat clear. If, if you can take a poem and you can turn it into prose, and you realize that by so doing, the, the poem in prose form seems to be reproducing itself, then you've encountered a really bad poem. You've encountered a poem that doesn't have with it some kind of kernel of meaning that it's in control of, that it offers at the beginning and then returns to, almost you'll see in, in Dunn's example, spherically at its conclusion. Um, this is a, 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 so automatic writing, for instance, or any kind of, of form of, of, of um, verse or prose production that doesn't know where it's going is something that Sidney object to. Spencer sadly sees these comments um, when uh, the Apology for Poetry um, comes out, but he's seen them previously um, in all likelihood. And when he prepares the 1590 edition of A Fairy Queen, and I should say that as a sub, as a, as a sub note to this that Spencer is um, a very difficult poet to teach, and the Shepherd's Calendar is almost impossible to teach. <laughs> but the, the Fairy Queen is a, is a complicated poem, and, and Spencer acknowledges the complexity of the Fairy Queen. And so what he does in the 1590 edition is he writes a letter to Walter Raleigh, who probably could have cared less about the Fairy Queen, but who was another um, prominent person at court with whom Spencer wanted to be attached. Uh, again, that didn't work out very well either. Um, and he, he writes a letter to Raleigh that, it, that, it, uh, that is in the 1590 edition of the Fairy Queen that's taken out of the 1596 edition of the Fairy Queen. Maybe Raleigh didn't want to be associated with the poem, or it's quite likely. Um, and, and this is the opening of the letter to Raleigh. Sir, knowing how doubtfully all allegories may be construed, in this book of mine, which I have entitled The Fairy Queen, being a continued allegory, or dark conceit, I have thought good as well for avoiding of jealous opinions and misconstructions as also for your better light in reading thereof, being so by your commanded, to discover unto you the general intention and meaning, which in the whole course thereof I have fashioned, without expressing any particular purposes or by accidents therein occasioned. I take this along with, along with Sidney's comment as, as, I mean, what Sidney's saying in example two, it seems to me to be, if the, if the poem is difficult, the, the poet has done something wrong in composing the poem. And Spencer seems to acknowledge this and say, well, I'll try to explain then what I'm doing in, the, in the, what is in the Fairy Queen, one of the longest poems we have in the English tradition. And it breaks off, as, as I, those of you who've looked at it know, after six and a half books. And Spencer uh, imagined writing either 12 or 24 books. It's not clear in terms of how he describes the, <laughs> the poem itself in, the, in this very letter. Um, so he's apologizing for the, I think, for the possible difficulty um, of the of the poem. And, and now his apology, um, if if we were to continue looking at this letter, we'd see the apology really um, is oriented around the problem of the fairy queen herself, the problem of the figuration of Queen Elizabeth, and how should a historical personage, a queen no less, be embodied and imagined in this poem. And Spencer suggests that he can't approximate the full power and splendor of Elizabeth with a, um, through a single personage. So he divides her up, and there are several women then who can represent. Elizabeth, and he mentions two. He mentions Gloriana, who doesn't appear in the poem. He mentions Belphoebe. This is a problem, though, because, of course, there are a lot of other women in the Fairy Queen, some of whom seem, um, some of whom, like um, Duessa, for instance, who take on the semblance, or, the, um, or, or at least the figuration, of a monarchical type, and then end up being quite, quite horrible. So there, there's, in other words, so, so there's a defensiveness here in terms of the, in, uh, interpretively, which is to say that Spencer is concerned about people maybe pulling uh, meaning out of the poem that he wouldn't want to have pulled out of it. He's worried uh, to a degree about misinterpretation, but he's also worried about the structure of the poem, the allegorical structure of the poem, and what it means to write a poem that requires that one make correspondences and moves that are at many, at many junctures in the fairy quite difficult. So I just want to move, uh, move on then, on, this is my hand out here for uh, just a moment, and, and think about these words for, for just a second. The word difficult, um, and then I coupled with it the word paradox. Um, I don't know, I'm sure, I'm sure that, the, that, that someone else could do a, a genealogy of the word difficult and connect it with a number of poets. But in, the, uh, in this period, in the English tradition, it's very rare to find poets, or readers for that matter, respond to a poem they've read and say, it's difficult, I didn't understand it. Unless they say in the Sydney um, uh, formula that I proposed, um, it, it was difficult, I tried to understand it, but I couldn't because there was no meaning there, therefore it's a bad poem. <laughs> now, w one could be tempted to say, well, is this about a cultural moment in which admitting the inability to interpret something is itself very vexed? And so the counterexample I would pose to you, I just put his name at the bottom of the handout, is, 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 the, is the author of the, uh, of the book that is, that is most commonly cited as a difficult text in the early modern period, which is Joseph Mead's The, uh, the Key of the Revelation in 1627. That's um, of the genre of historical chronology. And Mead was a very accomplished Cambridge professor uh, with whom Milton studied briefly who wrote this key to, as, as people are still doing to this day, to try to calculate at what precise point in historical time the apocalypse would occur. 
and th so this doesn't um, this text doesn't just include um, dating um, trying to figure out when an event in Exodus occurs as opposed to an event in Leviticus but but also tr um, establishes through graphs um, th um, through reference to even geometrical figures at, at points in time, the different cycles of history that are coming to a close and then rebeginning and then constituting, finally ending in the apocalypse. M Milton and others would acknowledge this to be tremendously difficult material to handle. And when, um, in The Alchemist, when Ben Johnson, um, when the character Dahl Common is employed to perform as if she were a lunatic, she actually <laughs> cites and uh, quotes passages from an earlier work of historical chronology written by Scaliger. So in other words, this is a kind of prose that is difficult and bewildering enough to imagine, um, to, to suggest some kind of lunacy. But difficult itself as a word is kind of interesting. I, was, I wasn't aware, um, the OED, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary, and of course it should only be used if it conforms to your argument. Um, um, but I was, um, I was thrilled to find, um, and therefore it must be true, that the earliest use of the word difficult to mean not easy, requiring effort or labor, um, is, occurs in 1527 in Hacklet's, Richard Hacklet's, Touching the Discovery of America, um, the Diver's Voyage, Touching the Discovery of America, attributed to um, Robert Thorne, who was one of the ship captains on the voyage. Now, I don't know who he's referring to when he says, things difficult they have made facile. But I love the idea of difficulty being associated with, with this idea, with exploration. That seems to me to be um, a venue and, a, and an enterprise in which it associates um, with difficulty. So when poets want to talk or readers want to discuss or suggest that they've encountered verse that has challenged them. What word do they use if they don't generally use difficult? A lot of times they use the word paradox. I looked up paradox in the OED, and lo and behold, it, uh, if, if, we, if we buy the, the, um, the earliest use of paradox to mean a statement or tenet, and I just want to read this because difficult pops up here, you'll see, interestingly. The statement or tenet contrary to received opinion or belief, especially one that is difficult to believe. And then we have an example from, a perfect example from the confutation of Tyndale's answer in 1533, where Moore's whole project is to look at what Tyndale has attempted to gloss in scripture and suggest that, and, and his, in the word choice is precisely in his translation of scripture, and, and what Moore will do will settle on each of these moments and suggest that Tyndale's used the wrong word, that he's created something paradoxical. Now, I think this is really interesting, this idea of paradox, because it seems to me that in order for something to be registered as paradoxical, we actually have to understand the paradox. Otherwise, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So paradox, actually, if it suggests um, a limit or if it, if it suggests a, a venue in which we might actually encounter the incomprehensible, we find again and again in the poetry of this period, at least, that what is proposed to be incomprehensible is going to be explained to us in some manner. Again, put forward, placed in front of the reader to say, do you still not understand this? Um, and so this is um, a, a feature of, of a lot of short lyrics that I just wanted to, to touch on with Dunn as one example. I'll get to it in just a moment. First, I'm going I'm to go to Dunn through Hamlet, but, um, which is the, the feature of a, sh a, a consistent feature of many short lyrics, especially Dunn and also Herbert um, and Crashaw and Traherne and Milton as well, the early Milton, is to, is to propose in a poem that there's a problem, something that is paradoxical, and then to explain a solution to that problem. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of that in just a second. I want to juxtapose that example with, with um, the sort of other side of the story here, which is the legacy of scholasticism, in which what especially the university-educated men are responding to in this period is an encounter with scholastic theology, which they universally, including Milton, found to be enormously difficult and frustrating in its difficulty. <laughs> so I think one of the things that's happening in short lyric is to appropriate the measure of difficulty that comes from a scholastic uh, inheritance and to reclaim it as something that actually rhetorically is still interesting but can be used at, to uh, unpack meaning. So um, the example from Hamlet, which I won't linger on, is I think an example of w where we're um, approaching something that is uh, formulated as a paradox. It doesn't quite work as a paradox. And the fact that it doesn't quite work seems to be the, precisely the point. Hamlet is saying this is the, on the heels of the to be or, to be or not to be soliloquy. He's, he's encountered Ophelia and Polonius and Claudius are listening in on the conversation. And um, Ophelia has returned his letters. And, 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 and Hamlet, is, uh, upon the receipt of the letters, now begins to attack her and, has, and is attacking her. This is the get thee to a nunnery moment is coming up, but he's attacking her um, precisely um, for, um, um, by suggesting that her, f that her fairness, her beauty, will compromise a notion of her honesty, will compromise her chastity, if it hasn't already. Um, I truly, he says, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bod than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. And we think if we step back and 
I, I think we can understand this passage, but when we start to look at the passage, we realize that its parts don't entirely measure up. We have three parts in the first half. Beauty transform honest, transforms honesty to a bod. And then we have honesty, which cannot translate beauty into honesty. <laughs> we have a kind of short circuit in the paradoxical arrangement here. I, I think it's suggesting to us that Hamlet's thinking is not, is not quite um, as, as uh, on a sure, uh, sure, uh, as sure a footing as it should be in order to handle the paradox. The paradox has revealed itself as not being paradoxical for the reasons that Hamlet would suggest it to be. What's paradoxical is that Hamlet doesn't really understand paradox. <laughs> so uh, just two other quick examples now. Um, thinking about since um, I'm leading a seminar on Dunn at the moment. And um, so what is, um, first of all, the sort of side note on Dunn, Dunn is one of these poets, especially in the 18th century, who is regarded as being difficult. And the whole idea of, um, the, of the metaphysical conceit, the jarring of opposites, as Samuel Johnson calls it, with, with some disdain, um, that, that posthumous characterization of the poetry that Dunn and others of his generation wrote um, as being metaphysical suggests that it is, is difficult in a way, but, but difficult again uh, in, a, in a faulty way. That is to say, what makes it potentially difficult is it mixes rhetorical registers. It combines, in, in the case of uh, Johnson's, uh, distrust of metaphysical conceits. It combines the physical with the spiritual in such a way that they're hard to tell apart. So, um, uh, and, and Dunn is a difficult poet. I think Good Friday, um, 1613, the poem, that um, the opening of which I want to read to you, is an example of a kind of Dunnian difficulty that, um, that, I, I, that I think we could pause over. And I put next to it um, just one of the many questions from Aquinas' um, from the Summa Theologia. And what we see is that, um, what I would suggest to you is that the the opening of Good Friday performs a kind of error that the poem is going to work to correct. And, and, and it is a reading test for us to be able to establish where we think the poet is an error. But then there's also, it's also incumbent upon the poet to try to explain this error away. Uh, this is how every one of Aquinas' questions begins. You know, he'll have the objections. And in, in this case, the one I, the one I offered is, is whether or not the human soul is subsistent. Well, of course the human soul is. It has to be subsistent. If it's not subsistent, you can't punish um, the fallen um, at the day of judgment. But Aquinas starts by saying, well, maybe it isn't. Here are people who don't think it is. Objection one, objection two, objection three. Um, it would seem, this is the first one, it would seem that the human soul is not something subsistent. For that which subsists is said to be this particular thing. Now, this particular thing is said not of the soul, but of that which is composed of soul and body, therefore the soul is not something subsistent. This kind of language, of course, is parodied all, over, all throughout the Renaissance. Shakespeare makes fun of it um, more than uh, just about anyone. Um, it establishes the idea um, that the human soul, um, it, it establishes an error, but it sustains the error, at least through the first objection. And then look at the beginning of, um, of Dunn's poem, Good Friday. Uh, again, begins almost uh, geometrically with a proposition. Let man's soul be a sphere. So. Uh, um, let man's soul be a sphere, and then in this, the intelligence that moves devotion is. So we have this three-dimensional figure, all points of which are equidistant from a fixed point in the middle, this sphere. And then we have intelligence proposed as that which moves the sphere. Now we have intelligence that's associated in the second line connected with devotion. An interesting move for Dunn to make to suggest that there's an intelligence um, and in the practices not just of, in, 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 of, of the intellect, um, well, that the practices of the intellect are connected to devotion in some way. Let man's soul be a sphere, and then in this, the intelligence that moves devotion is. And as the other spheres, by being grown subject to foreign motions, lose their own, and being by others hurried every day, scarce in a year, their natural form obey. Pleasure or business, so our souls admit, for their first mover, and our world by it. So that if there's an error, for, first of all, there's ambiguity in the, in the poem, and the ambiguity rests on the motion of the spheres that Dunn refers to after setting up his analogy. The spheres of the planets, are they um, heliocentric? Are they Copernican? Um, are they Keplerian? In other words, does he acknowledge that the orbit of the spheres is, are, uh, um, are, are themselves inherently corrupted by other spheres? Or is he suggesting in another reading, the earlier reading, this would be the more heliocentric Copernican reading, that you have the perfect um, orbit of the sphere, a planet, around the sun. However, it can be obstructed or it can be changed, altered, in, um, in a universe in which there is fluctuation and change. The, the error seems clear at the conclusion of the eight lines with this idea of the first mover. The first mover, um, we know if we go to Aquinas or if we go to Aristotle, um, is, is God, either in a Christian form or, or in its more ambiguous, because it's not moralized, Greek form. But that's not the, that's not the first mover in the poem. The first mover in the poem is pleasure or business. And the poet sets this up for us. Um, 
as a kind of, I mean, some have interpreted this um, along the lines of reader response um, theory and criticism as a, an example of, of a poet testing us to see if we're paying attention, if we're getting, um, if, if, if we're um, measuring the, uh, the difficulty of encountering, um, in this instance, um, a particular extended metaphor. What I, what I would just suggest is that when, when we're asked to encounter difficulty in this way, we're, we're dealing with a kind of difficulty that has some, uh, some parameters around it. We're not dealing with the abyss of, 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 of non-meaning. We're not dealing um, with something that we, can't, um, that we might find that we can't understand. And on, on that note, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, it, it is interesting, it seems to me, in the modernist examples to find how often the specificity of examples is what creates the ambiguity and the difficulty. Whereas in early modern instances, it's often not the specificity but rather something much more, um, much more macro, uh, uh, albeit, for instance, a theory of, of, of um, universal concord between planets or, or discord between planets um, that suggests us that often the move toward the difficult is occasioned in a move towards some, something spiritual that, that is supposed to organize uh, our encounters with the material world and that we're supposed to understand organizes our encounters of the material world, and yet we find ourselves often flummoxed by trying to understand the material through the spiritual. So I, I'll stop there, and I think we have uh, a minute and a half for a conversation. Thank you.